to another edition of Thunderdome. We got chapter 7, part 1. Let's get to it. Alright, so thinking, uh, intelligence, language, uh, all covered in this chapter. Uh, but we begin with cognition, which if you think about it at all, you have to know that it means thinking. You have to mean that it, you know, it, it is mental processes. Okay, reasoning, uh, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, our definition of cognition is the mental activities involved in acquiring, retaining, and using knowledge. Um, <laughs> cognitive processes, uh, perception, learning, memory, all of those things are tied into this. Um, and you'll see it right here. So we have cognitive psychology, which is a branch of psychology, a perspective of psychology. And in that, you have perception, human intelligence, language, thinking and problem solving, memory, attention. All right, so being focused um, would be one of those things. Um, so, uh, thinking is the manipulation of mental representations of information in order to draw inferences and conclusions. Uh, we'll go into this a little bit deeper in the coming slides, but it involves an active mental process, active mental processes, and is often directed towards some goal, purpose, or conclusion. So it involves two forms of mental representations, mental images, and concepts. So what is a mental image? Um, it is a mental representation of objects or events that are not physically present. This is something absolutely uh, that sets us apart from tons of other species. All right. If you don't realize that, that the fact that humans can do this, can hold things in their mind and rotate them and think about how long that it, gets, that it takes to get there and all that kind of stuff, that is something that sets us apart from uh, other organisms to the point where it might put us on top of the food chain. All right? Talking about cognitive maps and being able to you know, imagine things and seeing, seeing something with the mind's eye and rotating it. You know, so we can see it at a different angle inside of our own mind. Um, so, try to recite the letters of the alphabet that only have curved lines. You actually have to create mental images to do that. Okay, the alphabet's not in front of you, but you can go through it in your mind and see them right now. Okay? Um, it can also be mental representations not using imagery. So imagine the taste of, cho of chocolate milkshake, freshly popped popcorn, the smell of that, uh, the feel of the, uh, of the cold or wet clothing on your skin. You can feel that if you imagine it. Um, that is something, you know, pretty cool that we can do. Uh, Stephen Coslin performed a study where participants had to view and memorize a map of a fictional island. That island is right here. <clears throat> After the map was removed, Participants were asked to imagine a specific location on the island, such as a sandy beach. Then, a second location was named The Rock. The participants mentally scanned across the island and pushed a button when they came to The Rock. So, what did researchers find? They found that the amount of time that it took to mentally scan to the new location was directly related to the distance of the two points in the real image. So, the greater the distance, longer time. We scan mental images like we scan real images, which makes sense, okay? Um, we're using the same hardware in our minds to do so, but it's just, a, you know, an image that is created within our minds. Uh, we can also manipulate mental images. <clears throat> so two of these threes are backwards. Which ones? I'll let the viewer at home decide. I thought you told us not to answer the question. I sure did. You got it. You got it. Um, all right, concepts. So, <laughs> got it. Um, all right, concepts. A mental category of objects or ideas based on properties they share. Um, we build these things. I mean, we could have. We, we might be able to say concepts are also schemas. So mental lists and categories that we build in our brains um, from the moment that we exist until the present moment, okay? Um, you know, you start adding to these, you know, like the list of mammals that you know, 
right? The first thing that you come across, you're like, you might see a dog and be like, oh my gosh, look at that dog. Then you see a cat and you're like, oh my gosh, look at that dog. And your mom's like, no, that's a cat. And then uh, you're like, okay, so cats and dogs. And then you see a horse and you're like, look at that big dog. And they're like, no, that's actually a horse. And I was like, what? It is? It looks like a big dog to me. And I know. Now you know, horse, cat, dog. And then somebody's like, they're all mammals. And then you go to the aquarium and you see a whale. They're like, that's a mammal too. And then you have to build it. You're building this list of mammals and eventually it gets pretty great. But again, you're kind of, you know, new knowledge is coming in and you're building upon these concepts. So concepts provide a mental shorthand. Uh, and, and basically, again, it's, it's almost like a heuristic, which is a mental shortcut. Um, but food includes anything from a sardine to a red potato. Uh, although different, we can still group them together because they both share the central feature of being edible. The so categories can then be divided further. So furniture, and the tables, and the chairs, then the lamps. A formal concept all right, is a mental category that is formed by learning the rules or features that define it. It's attributes or features. So it's rigid. It is set. Okay, these features are set. If they meet these features, then boom, it is this thing. So rigid and logical rules we learn, shapes, liquid, gas, solid. If it meets these standards, it is that thing. A natural concept is a mental category that is formed by an everyday experience, and they become fuzzy. You're not quite sure what they are, but you're building them, you're, you're making these lists, and you're using two things to do it. A prototype and exemplars. A prototype is the most typical instance of a particular concept. So comparing the best example of that concept. So when you think of the best example of a vehicle, you would probably say car. All right? An exemplar, that's just any example of it. So individual instances of a concept or category held by memory. Examples that you can compare to other examples in the concept. So from prototypes to atypical examples. So when we say vehicles, then the top prototype would be a car. And then you can move down, right? And then it goes truck, bus, motorcycle, train, trolley car, bicycle, airplane, boat, all the way down, wheelchair, tank, horse, um, skates, uh, elevator. And then look at this one, fruit. What is the prototype of fruit? I don't know. I would say apple. But they've got an orange up there. You think it's tied? No. No, it's apple. Definitely. Um, so orange, apple, banana, peach, pear, apricot, plum, keep on going down, and then we get to uh, tomato and an olive. So is a coconut a fruit? Is it like a peach, apple, orange, cantaloupe? Oh, by the way, cantaloupe. Original name? Musk melon. Yeah. All right. Solving problems and making decisions. So obviously we do this a whole lot as a human. Um, problem solving. Thinking a behavior directed toward attaining a goal that is not readily available, so you want to get to an end goal, and hopefully you can get there to a point, um, you know, in as little steps as it possibly takes. So we engage in these instances so routinely that you might not notice the processes involved. I think that they say that humans make tens of thousands of decisions per day, and that's why at the end of the day you might suffer from this thing called decision fatigue, where you've actually made so many decisions in the day, some of them you don't even know that you've made, um, that it really does make your brain tired. Okay? Um, so ho holding on... I appreciate your goal. <laughs> holding on to, uh, you know, your work until the end of the day might not be the best thing in the world because you might have thought too much or tried to problem solve too much already in that day. Um, so before you can solve a problem, you must develop an accurate understanding of that problem. So a key step in problem solving, if, you, uh, if your representation of the problem is flawed, so might be your solutions. 
All right, so trial and error, pretty easy. So problem solving strategies. Trial and error is easy. This process of elimination, what's going to work, what's not going to work, uh, and then finally you find what, what works and you stick with it. So a problem solving strategy that involves attempting different solutions and eliminating those that don't work. So trying different seasonings as a chef until you find the one that actually does work. Um, then you have algorithms. Then you have algorithms. Um, this is just tried and true. If you apply the algorithm, you will get the answer. Okay? So this is a problem solving technique that involves following a specific rule, procedure, or method that inevitably produces the correct solution. It is guaranteed to work. So math formula is the example here. So it is it's guaranteed to work every single time converting Celsius to Fahrenheit. All right? And here is the process by doing so. All right? Celsius number, multiply, multiply by 9, divide by 5, add 32, Fahrenheit. The end. Pretty easy. That is an algorithm. Okay, so uh, a heuristic. Um, it's, it's a shortcut. That is what you have to know. It is a shortcut. Um, that's what I always think about whenever I see that word. Um, it's just going to simplify the problem for you. So, a problem solving strategy that involves following a general rule of thumb to reduce the number of possible solutions. So, simplifying the problem. So, breaking it up into sub goals. So, writing a term paper. Uh, you have your thesis statement, but within the thesis statement, you have probably three prongs that you're going to get into uh, as you write the paper. That is, break, that's, 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 you know, creating a, an outline would be a heuristic because you're simplifying the problem so that you can better solve or, or, or come to the solution. Um, so working backwards, starting with the end point, you determine the steps to get there. Um, this is huge. I mean, think how many times do you do this without you even knowing that you imagine the end of you, so you make a decision or you think about making a decision, but then you fast forward and you say, how is this going to play out in the end? And then you think about it, and then you work backwards from there, and, and, and you try to make you know, some correct assumption of whether or not that you've made the correct decision. I mean, you know how many people in this world fear making the wrong decision? For some people, it is debilitating. And if you keep on, if you keep on you know, being scared to make the wrong decision because you don't know how to properly identify the problem or work backwards or simplify the problem, um, again, it could be crippling to somebody. So <clears throat> insight, that's pretty easy. It's an aha moment, a moment of, uh, I think in, in Japan they call it the Harajuku moment, where this solution just comes to you. Aha. Right? It's the light bulb popping on top of the, on the, top of the cartoon's head. Um, so the sudden realization of how a problem can be solved. So having an aha moment. We'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, you know, then we have intuition. So coming to a conclusion or making a judgment without conscious awareness of the thought processes involved. We have a two-step model here. The guiding stage and the uh, integrative stage. So. The guiding stage, you perceive a pattern in the uh, information you're considering, but not consciously. So here's all of this information that's given to you. Uh, you are perceiving it, you are feeling the information, and this is like going to the urgent care or something like that, right? And, they, and you walk in and you tell them your symptoms. Um, the doctor doesn't necessarily have to, or the PA, right, the, phys, uh, the physician's assistant, doesn't have to like do anything or, or, or possibly run zero tests on you. They, they can go solely by doctor's intuition, which is a real thing. I appreciate your boldness. Um, and then we have the integrative stage. So representation of the pattern becomes conscious. You're like, oh my gosh, sore throat. 
diarrhea, weird rashes on your toes, COVID. Um, so at this point, a conscious analytic thought process takes, takes over. So doctor's intuition. Based on doctor's expertise, he or she sees a pattern in the symptoms. A hunch or educated guess is made to diagnose the patient. A hunch is consciously formulated, and then they order lab tests to confirm or disprove, but usually they are right. They see so many patients and have so many experiences with especially urgent care uh, physicians. They can assume very quickly. They can use their intuition um, to, to hopefully get to the bottom of the problem faster than most. Uh, all right, so here is uh, some demonstrations of insightful solutions. So we have problem one and problem two. So problem one, six drinking glasses are lined up in a row. The first three are full of water. So on the left side, they'll be full of water. One, two, three, full of water. All right? The last three are empty. These are empty. One, two, three, right here. <clears throat> By handling and moving only one glass, Change the arrangement so that no full glass is next to another full one, and no empty glass is next to another empty one. When you do this, you have, one, you're probably going to use mental representation, right? You're actually going to, you're not going to go to your uh, cabinet, you're not going to get six glasses out, you're not going to fill them up, and you're going to be like, okay, let's solve this problem. No, you can do it without that. You can mentally... You know, imagine this situation. And then when you do, you realize that you just take the second cup and pour it into the fourth cup. <coughs> or fifth cup. I can't remember. <laughs> fifth cup. I'm a social studies teacher, not a math teacher, okay? Stop yelling at me. <coughs> have this great one right here. A man who lived in a small town married 20 different women in that same town. All of them are still living and he never divorced any of them, yet he broke no laws. How could he do this? He a preacher. A minister. That's it. It's not even a joke, it's just a moment of insightful solutions. Um, all right. Ooh, one of my favorite things in psychology, because I'm fairly good at doing this. Um, it's just, you know, the, the fact that I'm presenting this whole thing on a bed sheet, held up by hangers, and using clips to weigh them down, and magnets, I'm 100% the functional fixedness master. I see things beyond for what they are. Okay? They can work like they're not supposed to. I appreciate your goals. So, functional fixedness. The tendency to view objects is functioning only in their usual or customary way. So, whenever you see something, you say, oh, that's a paper clip. Um, not. Uh, oh, that can reset my phone, right? Or, ooh, that, that paper clip can clean out the inside of my, uh, you know, charging port on my phone because lint got in there because my pockets are so linty. So, this prevents us from seeing the full range of ways in which an object can be used. Um, Mental set is kind of very similar to this. It's the tendency to persist in solving problems with solutions that have worked in the past. And this can put blinders on you. It's like, ooh, if it worked in the past, last time I did it, then ooh, I should do it this time. <laughs> but maybe it's just a little bit different. Right? And then you persist and you go and you say, ooh, this last time I did this and the trial and error and it worked this way, maybe not this time. And so now, you're stuck in a place and you can't finish the problem because you're using a solution that doesn't quite work with it or a, or a problem-solving technique that doesn't quite work to get that solution. 
<coughs> there's a good chance that if it, ha it has worked in the past, it will work again. But sometimes if we approach a problem with a rigid mental set, we may not see other possible solutions faster, quicker, better solutions. Uh, this right here is uh, St. Christopher. Um, you know, it's a pendant that um, a lot of travelers uh, have on them, specifically pilots, specifically old pilots. So back in the day, you know, you have all these instruments, right? <laughs> you have all these instruments that really go with pitch and yaw, right, and, and roll. And, um, you know, let's say that all those instruments go out. What do you do? How do you figure out where you are on the horizon and, 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 and what kind of angles you're taking and all that kind of stuff? This pendant, and I'm imagining this on a plane, which is silly because it definitely doesn't exist. There's a rear view mirror, right? And all of a sudden you hang this pendant onto the rear view mirror. Whenever you hang the pendant onto the rear view mirror, it, it hangs and dangles directly down to the ground, no matter what you do, right? And so, you know, I'm, I'm rolling this way, right? And I see this thing and it, it's, it's pointing directly to the ground. It's actually letting me see where I'm going and what kind of angles I'm taking in the plane. That was what it was used for. If all the instruments went down, hang this up, and you'll have an instrument there for you. And that was breaking functional fixedness. This is just a pendant. It's a necklace. Well, pilots knew that they could use it in a different way to hopefully and possibly save their lives and other people's lives as well. Um, all right. Mental set here, uh, the equations to the side expressed in Roman numerals. Okay, so this would be three, right? Um, right here would be four. So, uh, are obviously incorrect. Your task is to transform each incorrect equation into a correct equation by moving one matchstick in each equation. You can only use, you can only move it once, you can only move one matchstick. So only Roman numerals and the three arithmetic operations plus, minus, or equals are allowed. Remember in Roman numerals, this in case you don't know, I don't know. But, so, yeah, how would you do it? How would you make this right? You take this one and make it an equal sign, right? <laughs> Um, and then, let's see, this one right here. can't remember. Just stop my head. You take the equal and put it over here. Take this equal and put it over here. Yep, slide this right here. Uh, and then... <coughs> then you take this one. And you put it right here. No, that wouldn't work. This will work. Well, then it won't be an equal, so would it? No, because it would be 4 minus 